So one thing that Penn does really well, right? One thing that I've been here, like I said, three years and I was in New York for quite some time and um, been in healthcare for much longer. And one thing I give credit to Penn and I've learned a lot is governance. And so what I mean by that is, is a, a committed and a commitment from senior leaders, subject matter experts to get together and discuss what's urgent, what's necessary, the priorities around, you know, the puzzle at hand. And so we don't really necessarily get into technology conversations at the governance thing. We don't say vendor technology, vendor A, B, C. What we go into governance about is what's the sort of priority, right? And then the requester can be somebody in IS, it could be somebody from the business side, it could be somebody external. They'll bring all sorts of ideas to the table. And that's where these things sort of get prioritized. Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source for insights and best practices on the digital transformation of healthcare. Join host Patty Patmanaban, CEO of Demo Consulting and best-selling author of Healthcare Digital Transformation. How consumerism, technology, and pandemic are accelerating the future in conversation with healthcare and technology leaders. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Palbox. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Cash Patel, Vice President and Chief Digital Technology Officer at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia. Cash, thank you so much for setting aside the time and welcome to the show. Thank you, Patty. It's a pleasure to be here. You're most welcome and thank you for that. So why don't we start with, uh, just for the benefit of our listeners, a quick uh, overview of who Penn Medicine is and the patient populations that you serve. Yeah, hello everyone. So Penn Medicine in uh, Philadelphia, right? So we're everybody's heard of the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Penn Medicine is part of UPenn. UPenn has sort of multiple colleges, as you know, Wharton, School of Engineering, School of Nursing. So the School of Medicine is part of the uh, overall university um, environment. So within that, Penn Medicine itself, it's about the three major hospitals with five multi sort of specialty centers. So we typically would say internally about seven hospitals. We're all over the Pennsylvania area. We have three sort of large centers in the city at Lancaster, a large facility in the Princeton area in Jersey, and then it's sort of in the Chester County. But that's sort of the physical structure. And a little bit about Penn as part of the mission of the school, we focus on patients, obviously. There's a large education mission, which is a very uh, teaching facility. And then there's a large research mission. So we're one of the uh, top one, number two, number three, depending on, on which year it is on the NIH in terms of uh, grant recipients. So a large complex place. I know about um, 40 to 45,000 or so employees, which is about 7,000 sort of dedicated to the world of research. And uh, Penn Medicine and the University of Pennsylvania is also one of the oldest academic institutions in the country. Am I right? That is correct. Yeah, the history is uh, fascinating. And uh, I've been in it almost three years now, and I had a chance to tour these places. It's America's first hospital, a lot of history, many, many firsts. But yes, it's the, la- it's the oldest hospital formerly, um, and the building is still there, still seeing patients. There's a gorgeous library that's sort of been preserved over there from a historical context perspective with the, all the original charters and the original operating rooms are still preserved, not being used anymore, of course, but um, it's a fascinating history there. Yes, you're correct. Yeah, sounds fascinating. So, Cash, your role is that of Chief Digital Technology Officer. Can you maybe describe for us what the role entails and uh, then touch upon a handful of some of your important initiatives, especially from a, a digital transformation standpoint at Penn Medicine. Sure. Yeah, I, have a, I do have, I'm fortunate to have an interesting role, right? You know, one could say it's uh, challenging or difficult, but it is interesting for sure. So I have multiple hats and my, sort of my primary hat is to support the world of research in all aspects. And so both from basic sort of computing to high throughput gene sequencing, um, all the clinical trials work, the biobanking specimen work, all the everything that sort of entails research sort of falls under my area. I'm also responsible for 
software development for across the whole enterprise, both for the world of research, the school, the administration side, and the hospital side. And sort of overlaying this is that word, term that we call about digital technology. And so the idea is to have, have the transformation piece, the evolution piece, the journey pieces around Penn sort of making leaps in the world of digitizing its sort of environment. I was thinking about this as we were sort of preparing for this course. Some of the larger initiatives that we've done around digital transformation, there's a large emphasis. So if I put my research hat on just for a minute, there's a large emphasis on for us to digitize the uh, pipeline for research. And so if you think about Epic, for example, which is a, obviously a very well-known, robust EMR system, many, right. many institutions that, that we have. Historically, all, all the hospitals in general would have 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 different IT systems. And sort of as Epic has come along, we've moved them, you know, we shut them all down and sort of moved to Epic. And we have this sort of fully integrated um, system within Epic. We're trying to recreate that in the world of research. We're trying to, to we, in, in the world of research, we have multiple clinical, you know, the clinical trials is, is a whole component of stuff around, around the world of research. So we are now creating a sort of a roadmap and a journey to digitize our research platform that allows us to do all the pre-human subject trials and then all the way into sort of human subject trials and then ultimately into manufacturing. So Penn is about to manufacture its own, you know, research sort of based medication for um, patient use in the world of cancer. So we're, we're going the whole gamut, which is unusual for an academic center. You know, we have sort of aspects of pure research and then aspects of commercialization of the biotech piece. So that's a digital journey that's um, been um, pretty active. Another one that we um, have worked on is around patient engagement and patient experience. We're a big Epic shop, Epic everything, and revenue cycle, you know, the, obviously the clinical side, the pharmacy side, all of this stuff is all within Epic. We're making a large focus around the patient engagement and the patient experience pieces. Obviously, COVID has touched everyone, right? There's been a, a large shift to um, telemedicine. But if you think about it, it's not a simple matter of just telemedicine. You click a button and there's a video component available. Obviously, that's that's there. But there was a large amount of work that we did around how do you engage the patients before the telemedicine visit, for example, right? Preparing them, making sure they have the information. If they have to have any sort of blood work done, any testing done beforehand, that sort of all happened. So we created this sort of texting platform internally at Penn that sort of manages that whole patient engagement pre-telemedicine visit and then sort of post. And now that's turned, and as sort of as COVID, as we needed patients to come in for, for procedures, for example, we turned that also into, into sort of communication mechanisms around getting the patient tested, for example, for COVID before they come in for a physical visit. So mm -hmm. that's been a large initiative that we had to accelerate pretty quickly. Yeah, it's fascinating that your role is a multifaceted role at an institution where there is an academic program, there's a research program, and there is a a hospital or a set of hospitals is delivering care on a daily basis to a patient population. And so we could be here for hours if we were to cover all of that, and, and I would love to do that. But in the interest of time and to keep it a little bit focused, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the patient engagement side of it, which you just described, which is actually fascinating because of all the comments that you made around how COVID has sort of enabled you to adapt and also restructure yourself in light of what is coming in the world of virtual care, virtual medicine. And a lot of what we talk about on this podcast refers to patient engagement and specifically you hear terms like digital front door. And I know you've done quite a bit in that area. Can we double click on that a little bit and tell us a little bit more about some specific initiatives that you've launched? What kind of technology choices did you have to make and how did you go about making them? You mentioned Epic, obviously, but I'm sure you've looked at other tools and deployed other tools as well. So can you talk about the whole thought process and the journey a little bit? Sure. The telemedicine, sort of pausing for a second around from a business perspective, telemedicine, lots of people did it. It wasn't something that I honestly would say was sort of prime focus for many health centers, including Penn here. Then COVID happened, right? And then the need to accelerate telemedicine happened, just like, you know, we have to do it now. So, and then there was a lot of regulation, sort of easements, I would say, around, you know, encouraging telemedicine. So all of right. that created this environment for us to do something about it. 
And so when the business comes to us and says, how do we engage our patients and how do we do it quickly? We obviously had a video kind of click here to, to schedule piece of it. But what we didn't have is all of the, the other pieces that go around with uh, patient preparation. So fortunately, and we have been over time building a communication sort of platform internally that does sort of surveys and does SMS texting. It has a rules built engine. It's called Way to Help. It's actually done by within our sort of pen ecosystem, a whole separate team have built this, um, our innovation team. And so we piggyback off, you know, so the way to health team gets engaged and it's all sort of rules driven mechanism from a technology perspective, basically, you know, homegrown. But we use Twilio, for example, as a sort of texting mechanism, right? To sort yeah. of send the actual text out and then return it. We did some work with Google actually early on and we created a chatbot around COVID. There, there was an example. As soon as we had patients that were interested, we would send them the chatbot thing. And there was interaction around symptoms, right? How are you feeling about this COVID and, and sort of checking on their symptoms and, and to see if they needed other services. And, and, you know, the chatbot would engage and then get some sort of data around it to, and guide them towards um, information around other services. The hard part, the hard part wasn't necessarily the technology piece, but making sure that the experience was correct and light enough for engagement, right? And so we're fortunate, again, part of university, we partner with our other sort of colleges here. We have whole scientists looking at human behavior, human economics, for example, right? User interfaces. So we're able to bring a lot of that knowledge to the table and figure out what is the level of detail that a patient will sort of tolerate, adhere to, engage with, and feel positive about the experience, right? You've all been at the other end of these large surveys that take eight minutes and that's way too much, right? And that's the yeah. one of, none of us wants to do that. But we want enough information from our physician, from our hospital, from our doctor that says, you're listening, you're caring about me, you know something about me, you know, you're confirming my appointment. So it's not too burdensome, but it's enough to sort of engage. That was the trick. That was actually, the magic was in the, in the level of touch that we were putting in the communication piece. And then we had hand over to commercial services to go and do screening, for example, right? And so we, we would hand over to commercial services that would do screening for a patient and that would ensure that they had the COVID test, you know, somewhere, wherever they happen to be, the results are sort of uploaded, verified, right? Because we needed human people to go and verify these things. And then they would sort of kick back to us saying, persons have their COVID test, it's negative. Now they're ready for that visit, right? And so there was a whole bunch of integration sort of workflow around some of these things. Yeah, it's very interesting that you talk about the experience. And of course, the experience, the online experience for healthcare consumers is uh, not as mature, many would argue, as it is in other sectors. Think of uh, personal banking or uh, travel, uh, transportation, uh, e-commerce, any number of other industries. And so you mentioned a, a few really important things, you know, the patient's or the consumer's tolerance for what you really want them to engage with. You talk about the service. I get the press gaining surveys too, and I, I usually don't take them. <laughs> yeah. And so I fully understand what you mean by that. At the same time, I think you painted the picture of a patient journey too, which is very interesting because you talked about how a patient goes from seeking information, consuming the information, doing the symptom triaging, et cetera, et cetera. And that is all part of the uh, digital roadmap, if you will. And so as a leader for these technology solutions that are going to enable these experiences and the journeys, how do you make the trade-offs and how do you decide what kind of tool fits best at any specific point in the patient journey? Because you have a multitude of choices. You have the EHR, you have the big tech firms, you have digital health startups, and of course, you've got your own internal teams. How do you, can you walk us a little bit through your thought process when you look at these choices? So one thing that Penn does really well, right? One thing that I've been here, like I said, three years and I was in New York for quite some time and um, been in healthcare for much longer. And one thing I give credit to Penn and I've learned a lot is governance. And so what I mean by that is, is a, a committed and a commitment from senior leaders, subject matter experts to get together and discuss what's urgent, what's necessary, the priorities around, you know, the puzzle at hand. And so we don't really necessarily get into technology conversations at the governance thing. We don't say vendor technology, vendor A, B, C. What we go into governance about is what's the sort of priority, right? 
And then the requester can be somebody in IS, it could be somebody from the business side, it could be somebody external. They'll bring all sorts of ideas to the table. And that's where these things sort of get prioritized, right? And so this idea about COVID engagement with the patient, clearly it didn't require much effort to get it called a you know, reviewed by, by that governance team. But that's the formal trigger to say, this is important to the organization, get around this and then make it happen, right? And so then people like me and a whole host of other people start worrying about, you know, how, how do we make it happen? One of the things that Penn were focusing on is, like I said, we're an epic shock, right? So we, we will try and consciously, although I'm a software developer and I want to build everything always and, and don't want to buy anything off of the shelf, that's sort of my natural bias. My leadership bias is we have Epic. If it's in Epic, we're going to use the Epic solution first and foremost, right? Um, there's no point recreating the wheel. It integrates, it's secure, we know how it runs and how it works. And there's some areas that Epic is not focusing on or, or they're not mature in that cycle. And video conferencing, you know, the video and the telemedicine is an example of that. And I think in COVID, they partnered, actually, I think they did, they did partner with Twilio around the communication piece, but they didn't have a, what we would call a robust solution out of the box. It's maturing every day, right? And so at some point, Epic will totally have something that works. So there was something that, you know, so we, we would go out and look at our, our other vendors. At the time of COVID, physicians were using, you know, Teams and Zoom and a Google video in order to- Anything, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, there's the regulatory issues aside, security issues and stuff, and that's worrisome. And so we brought all that back in and, and had a more formal platform in terms of where telemedicine was all conducted through through a sort of standard platform. So I think governance is the key to sort of saying, here's a project. Then we have the technical governance groups around saying what technology platform we're going to use. We're always going to be biased into something that we can support, Patty. And then we're a large organization. And if we start to pick the latest tool from a vendor, from a startup, we get confused very quickly, right? So we're going to go with the background of the assets we have, the knowledge that we have, and the people that we have. So that's sort of what I would say, the, the intent. But then when you speak about how do vendors sort of engage with us, right? And I think you, that's the question you were sort of at the tail end of your statement there. We, we're open to always looking at new ideas and new technologies. We're doing this in the world of genetics right now. We're looking at um, vendors to do genomic science in the cloud with a little more proven sort of technology. We are working with new startups around AI algorithms and radiology that we're doing use case validation with, for example. If there's a, an idea and a vendor out there, their path to us may not be formal, but once they find who's an executive, who's a sponsor, some, some way of talking to us, Penn has a mechanism and you know, I sit on sort of various governance groups that we will engage with those new idea generators and we will bring them to the table and say, look, we think this company, this firm, these people have a, have a new idea, let's look at it. And therefore we'll then go back to governance and say, let's spend some time, some cycles looking at this stuff. We can't look at everything that comes on our door. Yeah. Yeah. And that's always been the challenge is how do you sort of balance that stuff? But our focus for now is genomics and, you know, I wouldn't call it um, AI for the sake of AI, but how do you make it sort of pragmatic and sort of patient focused? Yeah, yeah. I'll come to the data analytics AI piece in a minute. I just have one follow-up question to the question of technology, which is what is the role of your internal enterprise IT platform? We've talked about Epic, but are there core pieces in your infrastructure that you consider critical for enabling the seamless experiences that you talked about, for enabling the patient engagement? platforms and tools and making it robust and making it easy to use, making it light, all of the stuff that you talked about. Yeah, we're, we're not, so, you know, with my development hat on and my development manager, we're beginning to, so we were, you know, we're Microsoft Azure shop with lots of micro, Microsoft-based technologies with SQL Server and, and that stack. We have some Java components and sort of JavaScript components. That's kind of what I would say the sort of bread and butter pieces of it. We're now moving to containerization in the cloud. So one of the things that Penn's beginning to do is to utilize Microsoft Azure as a sort of standard bearer for, for our world. We're now beginning to think about containerization in the cloud, thinking about analytics in the cloud and sort of our development stack in the cloud. The obvious reasons are, you know, the scale and, and all of the stuff that goes with it, but the idea of containerization will also help us mingle other technologies without getting you know, too thin in terms of our own um, technology stack. So that's our intent. The whole cloud, the shift to the cloud is sort of another one of those things that's on my plate. 
and so around development, around data, around high performance computing, how do we utilize that cloud? So for now, we're a Microsoft shop dominantly, and we intend to stay that way. That's sort of where our background and our knowledge stack is. And we'll, as we sort of move to the cloud, we'll start to entertain other technologies as long as they can be sort of containerized. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox. So let's talk about data and analytics for a second. You mentioned genomics, very interested in that because uh, I am told that there is uh, there are some special considerations when it comes to using genomic data, especially if you're going to use the data in the context of, let's say, a treatment plan and you know all the privacy, there's some regulatory issues around that. Uh, maybe you can touch on that briefly. And then in the broader context of harnessing different data sources, that's really the question that I want to ask, which is, there's a lot of emerging data sources out there. How do you go about harnessing it to drive improved outcomes for your own populations? And uh, maybe touch specifically on genomics and what is unique about genomics. Yeah, let me uh, start with the second part of that question and I'll move to the genomics thing. You are absolutely correct. There's tons of new data sources and all sorts of interesting ones coming up all the time. And our researchers come to us all the time and saying, you know, how can I use this? How can I access this, right? We built over the years, we call it PenGNP, and it's sort of 2.0 now. And so there's an a, a OMOP-based data model, standards-based sort of data model, in which we put all our phenotype data from Epic into this OMOP model that we're, um, we now launched. We have a data lake in Azure, that, um, all of our sort of data sort of sitting there in, in Azure. And we now created this thing called uh, PenGNP. We're building sort of self, self-service self user interfaces for researchers we have a bunch in epic already with slicer dicer and other sort of technologies and so that's sort of what i would say the basic sort of phenotype pieces we're now beginning to connect other sources of data to this right and so we actually have a pretty large biobanking data we now have three million samples that have been three million samples in our biobanking that are tracked you know blood tissue all sorts of stuff that data is now being linked to, to our phenotype data so that's a new set of data that's getting connected We now have universal consent about to go live. And so that's a big deal in the world of research where we have sort of one consent model for a variety of sort of research needs that have biobanking samples. Where we, in addition, we have our own sequencing machines that are sequencing these sample biospecimen data all the time, 24 seven. We're collecting all of this genomic data now that's consented with our EMR. And now the the, the sort of intersection of all of this will be in PenGMP. And so, the theoretical kind of questions that people can ask, like, you know, how many diabetics you have type two metformin between this age, right? Comes out in five seconds, we have whatever, 1,022. So out of that, how many do we have consented biobanking specimens on? 550, right? Out of the 550, how many have full sequencing data available? 390. And so we, we can now, we're doing this pseudo manually and the matter of sort of weeks and stuff we'll, we'll be able to do this all digitally and electronically and mm. then we can now move that data into our um, high performance uh, computing cluster that will sit in Azure. we already have one on prem already with a whole bunch of genetic sequencing tools around it to be able to sort of de- do deeper dives so that's sort of the area of sort of genomics that are, are um, going on and we're also now building this thing on a, a graph database in the world of research that can um, graphically represent nodes of data in terms of their inter sort of relationships. So if you know, yeah. and so we're now doing that with SNOMED terms, with you know, drug terminology, with genomic terminology, with a whole variety of any ontology will be able to sort of plug into this. So papers are being published, a whole bunch of research is done, my team's sort of building the front end. So we're actually coming at it from two ways, the Penn GMP thing and this sort of um, ontology sort of graphical view using graph around these um, various sort of data sets. And ultimately they'll both sit on some cloud instance somewhere. You touched briefly upon the AI and analytics space. Have you started uh, applying advanced analytics to this, uh, uh, to the data that you're gathering on your data lake? Can you talk about one or two uh, success stories, if you will, uh, where you've actually been able to make a, make a yeah. significant difference to the outcomes? We have a team, a data science team about um, nine to 11 people full-time dedicated to this very subject. And what they're doing is they have sort of two, now this is outside of the world of research. We, we you know, we have a whole host of people focused yeah, on, yeah. purely on research and stuff, but on around the hospitals operations piece, our data science team 
is all they're doing is they're doing two things, two types of sort of thinking. One one type of thinking is they take a model from Epic. So Epic has nine or nine, I think nine or ten models available, and you know they'll take an Epic model for example, and the Epic model will say something like prediction of sepsis scores, right? Our data science team will take that um, information and come up and, and, and look at that information, see all the mapping that happens in the background, test all the assumptions for mapping and say, right, Epic is saying it's 98% you know, sensitivity sort of rating around that model. Our team will go and validate that, say, all right, we can make that 98 to 98.5 or, or something around that model. So they're validating the Epic models as sort of one approach. And another approach is they're doing sort of a lot of sort of modeling themselves around a whole bunch of sort of other hypotheses. One of the, the stuff around, I think there's a potassium test that happens in ED that's notoriously sort of incorrect. That's one that they're sort of actively um, working on that I know of. I'm just trying to, as they're sort of racking, I'm racking my brain on other areas that are sort of published on, but they're the two that sort of come to mind immediately. Yeah, and I'm sure that's a whole different topic that we can dive into in yeah. a whole separate conversation. I want to go back to the governance model for a second. You described it uh, fairly clearly, and uh, I just want to ask one follow-up question on that, which is as it relates to the overall execution of a digital transformation strategy, where does the leadership lie? Is it with one individual? Is it with a group of individuals? What's the process you go through for really identifying, you know, you mentioned that there's a process for, you know, determining what's a priority and what is not, or whether something is going to get funded and approved or not. But at, a, at an enterprise level, is there, a, is there a governance model, a documented digital roadmap, for instance, and is there a single leader driving it or is it a group of leaders? Can you talk a little bit about that. So we have governance from a, what I would say, business-focused perspective, right? And so there's something, we have a senior governance piece where some members of the executive committee, the dean's office will sit in. And then we have a um, IT research sort of governance piece. We have governance around Epic, um, governance around innovation for, for software. So there's sort of the, the sort of subcommittees around there. Yeah. The reason I'm sort of saying them separately is each sort of have a, their own sort of domain and focus areas around you know, their, their, their specific sort of subject areas. And then they will make recommendations that um, sort of sometimes they don't go up the chain or they need to go up the chain around what um, direction we're taking. So that's sort of the governance on the strategy side. But there's also governance around there's also governance around data, for example, right? We have members of our executive team, senior executive team members, part of our data governance team around, you know, being crystal clear about who owns that financial report, right? When COVID happened is a good example of, there was an awful lot of noise around data collection and what does that data mean and not mean, et cetera, et cetera. And all that the federal government was causing a lot of, you know, their, their definitions were changing, the CPT's definitions were changing, right? The state's definitions were changing. And ultimately we went to a C-level person and said, all right, you C-level person happened to be the chief medical officer and somebody else. They made the call on on the on the specific definitions of admission or non-admission or an ED COVID visit or not, and that that was this is what Penn does really well. We get senior leaders engaged, and sometimes other organizations might consider minutia, but it's absolutely critical. They they drive the clarity. Once the clarity has been there, everybody else sort of follows. And then, you know, our reporting structure hasn't changed. Almost, I think, two three weeks into COVID, we pretty much had the same reporting details without any major change of definition. So there's been a lot of engagement around that, but we have layers around the, the strategy or the application and the approach conversations with, with our governance teams. And that's where things get approved and funded, right? That's where we go yeah. with you know, an exa another example in the genomics thing. We created this thing called a genomics release portal. And we now get genomic data from wherever it gets processed in the lab. It comes to our portal our genomic counselor will review it and making sure that the annotations and any comments are appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. And then they will release it for physician viewing in Epic. So think about it, right? It doesn't go directly into Epic for the physician that right. ordered it, right? It goes to a genetic counselor, they review and approve it, and then it goes into Epic. Epic doesn't have this feature yet. They will build it. We're working with Epic. I'm sure it'll come very soon. It won't be too far away. But that's some of the cutting edge stuff that we're doing because of the governance group because of the research group that are involved in this at the sort of right level, right? And so they, they will bring these challenges to us as a team and we'll go and provide, you know, solutions and approaches to these things. Fascinating. So let me switch tracks here. And we always talk about the yin and the yang of all of this, because as much as we would like to look at uh, 
all the good things we get out of it uh, and all the things we're able to accomplish with the technology investments we make, there are also some challenges and barriers that we have to deal with in every environment. And one of the things that uh, in the context of healthcare has been traditionally a degree of technical debt, and I'm not speaking specifically about pen medicine, but across the board with health systems in general, outdated technologies, a little bit of technical debt, and also, you know, sometimes just you're, you're holding legacy technology that you can't get out of for financial or other historical reasons. So what's your approach to addressing this, especially as, you know, the transfer, digital transformation starts accelerating and the demands on the, from the technology side to scale up, become more robust, and do more things, just intensify by the day. You know, we're a large organization and somebody comes to us and says, um, you know, I want this CRM solution, right? And it's going to cure world hunger or something, you know, and we look at ourselves internally and, you know, we've got one of each already. We're just so big as, a, as an organization. And we, we usually have so much of stuff over the years that somebody has purchased. Now, Penn, again, I would say has got way more controlled and better in terms of their purchasing mechanisms. You know, years ago, a department would buy something and another department may not know. Now that doesn't happen, right? So that that has definitely helped just managing our inventory. But IT, you know, and IS goes through regular inventory sort of controls. We go through life cycles of our solutions. We don't renew things automatically. That, that, that sort of renew flag in our systems have been turned off. So somebody in leadership, a VP, an AVP, has to review those mechanisms about renewal and contracts and stuff. And there's always a difficult conversation around sunsetting and all of these solutions, right? If we have another solution available that's going to do something similar, why, why are we paying this thing twice, right? And so we have those conversations all the time. Finance always challenges us to sunset these things and watch the contract pieces. So that's sort of on the obvious side. The not so obvious side is when new ideas and new, new approaches come to fore, right? So to bear, the cloud is a good example where, you know, it is expensive. The cloud, you know, everybody would say running a data center in the cloud, virtualizing your data center isn't cheaper and you can still do it on site, on prem, especially if you own the building, right? That's something yeah. that's a big cost factor and Penn owns most of its buildings. But there's technologies available in the cloud that aren't necessarily easily deployed on prem. An example that we're working on now is, is our, you know, going back to our this sort of data and analytics, we're focusing on doing data and analytics in the cloud. We're not creating large servers on prem to host all of this data, to do all the sort of computing. Our data science development is all done in the cloud. And we're about to do high performance computing in the cloud. We actually have a pretty large environment with 400 sort of cores, four, sorry, 40,000 cores running on site but we're not refreshing that hardware. So as that sort of hardware ages itself out, we're moving that, that sort of capability into the cloud. So as I think, so the logical answer is when permissible, we're moving to the cloud, but we're also beginning to take advantage of new sort of services and, and solutions in the cloud. The genomics thing, vendors are now providing advanced sort of analytics in the cloud for genomics, and we're, we're, we're creating our pipelines to, to that. We're working with Google, we work with Amazon, we work with Microsoft to try and take advantage of these things. But I would say we're cautious about it because expense is the challenge for the cloud is it's not so obvious from a cost perspective. So we take yeah. each need cautiously, I think, and we're going to be a little more conservative. We're not going to be like other industries always sort of jumping into that. But that whole debt conversation is, is a focus, right? We're not, like I said, doing the obvious 101 contracting thing. We don't auto renew, we review our things and we then we have a sunsetting conversation and a roadmap conversation. So this is something IT does once a quarter formally within our own leadership and focusing on, on how we sort of transition our applications. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, what about the risks of innovation and new technology, harnessing new technologies? Now, it's one thing to place your bets on Azure, a big company, Microsoft, you're not going to go wrong, broadly speaking. But... There's a lot of innovation coming out of smaller companies, startups, VC funded, you know, or a series A round, have a few mm -hmm. million in the bank and have a really, really interesting tool, but they're on the edge all the time. You know, they could run out of money. They, uh, they could lose people. You know, one out of 10 will make it despite all the activity out there. Can you talk a little bit about the, the uh, governance around managing these resilient? Do you ever have to pull a solution out because of, things like 
than going out of business and things like that? Yeah. If I put my corporate hat on, we're going, you know, if I'd be honest about it, we're going to lean towards that proven technology. You know, we're not going to be that sort of bleeding edge in our hospital operations piece, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got our core business, that's not going to be bleeding edge. But, you know, we have a, so Penn being part of the university, every university campus has its own sort of innovation sort of focus. We have a incubator lab that Penn sort of funds and have all sorts of, you know, ideas being generated there. We have, you know, and even in the space of biotech, we've created lots of spin-off companies in the world of biotech. There's a formal legal group that focuses on creating IP that generated within Penn to commercialize it. So Penn recognizes the value of innovation, you know, formally invests in it, um, has people supporting both innovation from the outside coming into Penn and then innovation from Penn and going to the outside world. So that's there for sure. But when we put our sort of corporate hats on from a, from a business of running healthcare, we're going to be a little cautious of, of, of bringing somebody in that sort of says, you know, oh, we're going to replace Epic for you, right? I mean, that's unlikely to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but there are governance groups that are focusing on, on new ideas and new vendors. You know, I sit on some of those groups. Vendors can come in and make their pitch. They can make pitches to people like me. And then I go and find internal stakeholders that, are, that may be interested. And then we go and have a conversation around something. And if that sort of catches on, you know, we'll, we'll bring them into the fold some more. You know, the other hats I wear is I act sort of as an advisor to these um, forums and these sort of places. I, I was part of the um, e-health initiative in New York City where there was a formal sort of advisement event twice a year where the, the um, startups would come and pitch. And, you know, it was almost like um, the TV show where they come and pitch their ideas and kind of give feedback. So we've done a lot of that. Penn does some of that as part of the, the university program. So I wouldn't say it's no, but on the healthcare side, it's a little more conservative. But what I find works best is to find uh, like-minded people. And so if there's somebody who's generated an idea. I remember somebody coming to me and they had this, um, they had this camera that could see inside your ear with a small device that you could place on the outside of the ear and do some mm -hmm. diagnosis, right? And I, I wouldn't know anything about it, but I put them in touch with the ENT doctors and now they've hit it off and now they're talking about doing something collaborative in the space of research. And that's how it typically starts. They do a research project together, something gets published, something gets validated, and then somebody somewhere goes back to the hospital and says, we could bring this into patient care as a standard care model. And that's typically how I found those smaller ideas um, emerging to what I would say, you know, platform or commercial or more sort of scaled use. The key is to find those like-minded individuals in the organization and connect the new vendor, the new company founder or something. So, Yeah, and to be patient, right? Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take uh, an extended period of time, especially if it's a sort of cutting edge, brand new tech yeah. uh, kind of a thing. It might take months, who knows, maybe even years before it reaches enterprise scale. And that's that's something that most startups struggle with. And again, it's just uh, the nature of the game, I guess. Well, Cash, we're, we're coming up to the end of our time here. It's been a fascinating conversation. I want to close this out with one, one uh, question. You've seen a lot already you know, in the last three years that you've been at Penn and, of course, in your previous lives at, in New York and uh, elsewhere. So if there's one or two best practices that you've learned through your experience that you would like to share with your peers in the industry, what would it be? I'm a developer by training, by background. When I started in my career, I would I would just go and build something and say, look how clever I am. This is what I've done, you know, and um, show it to people. Even if it was awesome, the reaction was, in my opinion, muted. And as I got older, what I realized, it wasn't a building something that was clever and awesome. What was the hard part is, is to, to get, get sponsorship, to get buy-in, to get acceptance of your idea. And what I'm focused on later on in my career is to find the right business partner that shares the same sort of vision and passion as you do. And so I have found my journey more focusing not on technology and how clever we can build it, but going and finding those, and they don't have to be necessarily C-level sweet people, right? But they have to be somebody of influence and maybe it's two, three people, but usually not more than that, is to go and spend your time building those relationships. Spend your time identifying those individuals that are, you know, who are going to think out of the box, be a little more courageous and willing to support the idea that you're working on. And once you've got that team, 
or that umbrella in place, knock yourself out, go and build something, go and do something, go and get something clever done. But I, I do think, you know, my my converse, my guidance to people thinking about this is go and find your sponsorship team first and focus on that as a leader in this space. Go and, go and spend a considerable amount of your energy up front in that space. It, it makes the adoption thing much, much um, smoother. Um, yeah. As you go to it, so. Oh, that is that is really good advice. Well, Cash, it's it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and thank you so much for setting aside the time. I look forward to staying in touch and following all the you know, progress and all the great initiatives that are coming out of Penn Medicine. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Patty. It's uh, great talking to you. Have a good day. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can reach us at info at thebigunlock.com with your feedback and questions. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox.